Conservancy Area Cedar Gorge, one of the largest in Russia, is celebrating its 100th anniversary. A tiger and a leopard, large wild cats, have made it famous. However, against their background, some not so famous but magnificent and extremely rare flora and fauna species are left unnoticed. Let's have a trip to find and to study them there. You can find a lot of paradoxal and surprising things there. For example, the most poisonous local snake is called a water snake. Yes, just like the harmless snakes with yellow spots on the head which you can meet in the European part of the country. The local people are quite tolerant to snakes. They don't try to hit copperhead snakes as people in central Russia do when they see a viper. More than that, they are positive to wood snakes. Anyway, I'd like to have a look at the most poisonous snake here in this region. Unsuccessful so far. We managed to detect and catch a Chinese tiger snake unexpectedly as usual. Well, we were sure that sooner or later we would meet it. But you never know which path to take and under which tree to look to hit the jackpot. That's the whole point of any forest trip. Alek, does it mean that you can meet not only Chinese tigers, but Chinese tiger snakes here as well? Well, sure. In fact, there are a lot of different types of living creatures and herbs, whose name contains the word tiger. Lily, for instance. Well, everything striped is tigers somehow. Yeah. And all spotted is leopards, correct? Oh, often so, yes. Its poison is very toxic, but unlike a copperhead snake, it doesn't use it for self-defense. Well, what if we would make it angry? Well, to do that, you need to put your finger into its mouth, and all such cases are a matter of statistics. In general, Rhabdophis includes water snakes. No, we call them genus keelbacks, but the scientists don't use such a term. They use genus Rhabdophis instead. It means tropic snakes. Colubrid snakes are the largest bloodline, including half of the snakes in the world. Starting from harmless water, grass, and wood snakes, up to mortally poisonous boomslang and Kirtland snake. So keelbacks, just like this Chinese tiger one, are not so close relatives to our dice and water snakes. Well, as far as I understand, this guy tries not to bite because it is not used to doing it for self-defense and uses the poison to hunt, correct? Yes, absolutely. It needs some poison to kill frogs and toads, a kind of obligatory amphibia eater. Well, it's a nice creature. Remember, you must not show too much familiarity dealing with any snake, even if it's not a poisonous one. If you happen to keep a snake with poisonous back teeth in your hands, remember that any careless movement can be a mortal one, as we have a lot of protruding parts in our body, which can be hit with a poisonous tooth. I heard that they made a serum somewhere. The Japanese make a serum indeed. They consider it to be an extremely dangerous poisonous snake. Just like our snake doesn't look like a Chinese tiger one, the other Far Eastern flora and fauna species differ from their Western European relatives. At the same time, that bio-community is absolutely unique. On the one hand, tropic animals dwell here. I mean a tiger, a leopard, and poisonous keelback. On the other hand, you can meet some animals typical for the north, including a musk deer and a brown bear. No wonder that amazing flora habitat has been formed there and you will see some plants which you will meet nowhere else. In that way, Ursuraland is a kind of bridge between taiga and jungle. Cedar Gorge received its conservancy area status at the beginning of the 20th century, when extended cutting trees and forest fires led to significant deforestation. Cutting trees, hunting, gold mining, and lime burning had been strictly prohibited. It may sound strange, but cedar, despite the name of the area, is not the most common local tree. By cedar, we often mean Siberian cedar or Pinus siberica. This one is a regular cedar, and that one is Korean pine with bigger cones and seeds. 
Well, a cedar, a cedar grows in Lebanon and in Tibet, to be exact. Well, yes, it's clear. Well, yes, generally speaking, all these pines are cedar ones. Yes, it happens so that some peoples called called a cedar the most valuable tree they had. And of course, a Siberian pine is called a cedar here. A regular pine has two needles in a fascicule, and Siberian dwarf pine and Siberian pine has five of them. Such pines are called five-needle pines. A lot of birds and animals adore ripe cedar nuts with soft and sweet kernels. Well, have a look yourself. We have put several cedar cones down here. We did that on purpose, as animals know that a cone on a tree is not ripe enough, and when it falls down, its nuts have ripened. And here we are, with a wobbly nutcracker, which started to land to pick up nuts one by one and to fly somewhere to hide them. A squirrel jumped to empty another one. It's amazing, but everyone who eats cedar nuts, both animals and birds, hide their stalks underground and try not to touch them there. However, large animals such as bears and boars often find and rob these stalks. They use their claws and fangs to hide some of the nuts under the ground, and in that way they plant them. It means that a cedar cannot propagate itself without such servicing and would have died off. Yes, it happens. Let's say in China. I have been in very old forests in the north of China, in cedar forests, I mean. The Chinese worship them and protect them well. And you know what those cedar, cedar forests don't have? There is no understory at all and no young cedar trees. As you know, animals are one of the key factors of normal existence of modern cedar forests. We are walking higher up the hill, where the forest is becoming thicker and the rivers are cleaner and faster. Here we met Manchurian blackwater snake, or Amur wood snake as it is often called. Large up to seven feet and strong. The snake has a cold-blooded hunter's character. By the way, these snakes very often dwell in granaries, barns, and attics. The owners don't mind as they reduce the number of mice and rats. Now it's time to start making you surprised. Here is a riddle. What kind of leaf and from what tree is it? Well, one of the poets said, oak, a violin one. What kind of violin is that? Nevertheless, it's an oak leaf, a Mongolian oak to be exact. Let's go ahead. It's a simple riddle, a very simple riddle indeed. What plant is it? Correct, it's a maple, a purple blue maple. And now the most difficult one. It is also a maple, a Manchus maple. You have no chances to meet that plant anywhere in the world, but here in the Far East. To introduce some other Far Eastern relatives of our trees, we will ask a professional botanist to stop his scientific research in a trial area for a while. Have we come? What tree is that? It's an iron birch, the endangered plant in the Russian Red Book. A white birch behind my tree, as a poet once said. It's black and doesn't look like a birch. It's wet. Look here. Ah, it's lighter here. Yes, indeed, it's ashy gray from that side. And even its cortex is softer here. Yes, yes. Well, birch bark is usually soft. Yes. It's iron because of the wood density, correct? Yes, the wood is highly dense and that's why people used it for their needs. So it became extinct and now it's in the Red Book. It's an extinct plant which grows mainly in that region in the south of Primoria region. Well, when you look at the leaves from the bottom up, you can tell that it is a birch tree indeed. Yes. But you can never tell looking at the trunk. Yes. Okay, let's go ahead. Apart from a wood snake and a Chinese tiger snake, there are a lot of different other kinds of snakes, but their poison is weaker. We were shown an entire colony of local copperhead snakes when we came to a lodge. Hi, Gleb. Hi there. Well, copperhead snakes are nothing unusual here. Yes, they are our neighbors. Wow. And I know a lot of them personally. Gleb, how often do they bite people? Copperhead snakes' bites, just like the bites of many other poisonous snakes, happen basically because of human stupidity. Well, that's clear. When folks are trying to catch a snake barehanded, and the snake starts its self-defense and bites the aggressor. A copperhead's poison is stronger than a viper's, 
and its bite is more painful. But, believe it or not, the number of people bitten by copperhead snakes is far less than the ones bitten by vipers. I wonder if that snake is calmer, or probably the humans. There are a lot of snakes in the conservation area, although they are not rich in genus. That is totally different for the forests. It's a real paradise for botanists. By the way, a tree will never fly, run, or creep away, so research is made thoroughly from year to year with the same objects and at the same areas. How many 27 objects do you have? 27 or? Yes, 27 kinds of trees. Do you have any specific type that you like the most? You know, a woman's soul should have the one to love. A Mongolian oak and a prickly castor oil tree are among my favorites. Prickly castor oil tree, that's the beauty? This one, yes. This is a red book plant which grows here in Primoria region in the northern border of its habitat. It belongs to an Aureliaceae family. When a tree's young, it has thorns. Yes. About half an inch long. And it becomes clear that it is? Yes. An Aureliaceae family? Yes. Not a maple? No, it's not a maple. When a tree grows older, the thorns will fall off. Once it was close to extinct because of the dense and beautiful wood. Nowadays, this relict tertiary tree has become very rare. Interestingly, to learn that when a prickly castor oil tree was firstly described, it was characterized as a maple tree. Although prickly thorns on the trunks of young trees confused the scientists. It was the thorns which hinted them to look for their relatives in the Aralycea family. Here is the Aralycea itself. The entire family, including 46 genera and countless number of kinds was named after it. Here is the Manchurian Aralia, or thorn tree, or devil's tree because of its formidable appearance. Legendary ginseng is the most famous kind of the Aralycea family. Here is the famous Alutoracochus, a sibling of ginseng. It has a strange Russian name of a freeberry as well, and is one of the treasures of the Usuri forest. The plant works miracles as it can easily mitigate fatigue and does a lot of other fantastic things. Seasonal rainfall is a characteristic feature of a monsoon climate, although long showers making rapid rivers boil with the following flood is common here. This time they upset our apple cart. It seemed that life in the forest stood still, as if waiting for the sun to help to come to the normality after the devastating flood. The Primoria forest is surprisingly generous. No matter which kind of grass you run into, it will be a famous healing herb. Any tree will be a valuable kind of wood, and any liana will bring you delicious and healthy fruit. Have a look at a magnolia vine, an actinidia, a ginseng, grapes, a moor cork tree with cork crust and areolcea herbs. Well, it seems that the weather is coming back to normal and the sun is shining. Tomorrow, all the living creatures will leave their hideaways. Of course, the local living creatures have gone nowhere. They have simply hidden looking at us from everywhere and laughing. Wow, you can pass by and fail to notice it. What a wonderful camouflage. This butterfly belongs to the family Geometridae and is called red underwing. Doesn't look like one, huh? Right now, magic for you. Have a look. Now, now beauty, put your upper wings at shoulder length. Come on, come on. Show your beautiful lower wings. Here they are, and they really look like red underwings. What does the butterfly need them for? Well, just imagine a sharp-sighted bird noticed it on a tree and wants to eat it up. It flies closer and suddenly the butterfly lifts its upper wings and something bright blazes on the trunk. The bird gets scared and flies away. Sometimes such tricks work. And here is the creature with whom a butterfly can do nothing. Sooner or later, it will leave its hideaway on the trunk, flap its wings, and can be easily caught with a treacherous and sticky spider's cobweb. 
Oh, what a beauty! Once upon a time, there lived a woman in ancient Greece, Arachne by name. She was extremely good at weaving. So good that once she decided to compete with the goddess Hera. Everyone knows who wins in such competitions. No doping scandal, of course, but she was turned into a she-spider. However, the spider science has been given its name of arachnology after that arachne. Such a cute little thing you are. These are such snake-like creatures, from small to gigantic which are not dangerous for humans. How do you like that wooden python? Well, such lianas do not grow in European forests. Come on. Here I am. I am standing on a bower actinidia, which we call spicy. Why do we call it so? Well, everyone knows the fruit of Ectinidia chinesis, or Chinese gooseberry, which are kiwi fruits. We buy kiwi fruits in grocery stores. That's a different kind of plant, with smaller but spicier fruit. That is why we call it Ectinidia spicy. Here is the actinidia fruit. Just imagine how high an old liana resting on the upper branches can lift the berries. However, you can find something probably not so delicious, but edible and quite useful under fallen leaves on the ground. Oh yes, I can see it. You will never die of hunger in the Usuri taiga. Take a guess, how many kinds of currants are here? I guess at least 10 to 15 or more. Siberian currant, Usuri currant, red currant. You name them all. I guess this is Maximovich currant. Mm. It's delicious. In Europe, red currant does not give its fruit in September. The local kinds of currant took part in creation of the European ones. On the other hand, neither of the local kinds is good enough to be domesticated outside its habitat somewhere in the West. That's even better. Introduction, a scientific term for growing plants outside their habitats, experiments sometimes bring poor results. There have been plenty of such negative attempts made with the Far Eastern flora and fauna. Right now, people in Europe don't know how to get rid of that terrible weed, which has occupied a great area there. It's hard to believe, but some 200 years ago, that plant, which is considered to have been ornamental, cost a fortune. The point is that until the end of the 17th, the beginning of the 18th century to be exact, Japan was isolated from the rest of the world. Hence, all the plants exported from that country cost a lot. That's the way Japanese knotweed, or sakalin, was introduced to the Europeans. Later, it bred in such large numbers that they still don't know how to get rid of it. Scientists call it an invasive species, as it can grow in such a great number that it becomes impossible to count. I've got a question. Do the herbs in the wild and the ones grown in plantations differ by their healing qualities? Yes, indeed. In fact, the herbs grown on a plantation are far weaker than the wild ones. It is determined by the speed of the growth as well as the speed of collecting or withdrawal or turnover of metabolites which are grown by plants and which are herbal bases. Well, probably the soil composition is different here as well than on a plantation. The soil composition as well. As a rule, it is poorer here and the plants experience a lot of stress 
stress while growing. The stress triggers generation of metabolites, and the herbs collect them. Sure, that is, herbs try to protect themselves from hard environmental conditions, and the substances collected in the herbs are medicinal ones. Thank you, it's clear, Pavel. That is, if you and I can find a ginseng here and dig out its root, its healing qualities, it is prohibited here. Don't you know that? I know that perfectly well, and I'm speaking theoretically. Yes. That means that its healing qualities will be far stronger than the ones of the ginseng grown on a plantation in the north of Europe or in China. That's true. Unfortunately, a lot of people know that, and there are a lot of poachers here. I mean, not the conservation area, but in the Far East as a whole. In the south of the region, where ginseng grows, there are a lot of poachers there. Just because people know that a root of wild ginseng costs several hundred times clear, more than the ones grown somewhere else on plantations. It seems that Mother Nature can provide us with a good chance to grow an extremely valuable raw material along with different herbs. We don't need to cultivate ginseng monocultural fields as if we grow corn or potatoes. It is more efficient to grow that herb in the wild underneath trees with valuable wood winded around by fruit-bearing lianas. That's the way to grow a real valuable herb, maximally close to its wild siblings. Now let's close our eyes and try to dream. And let's take Amur cork trees, for example. It's a wonderful honey plant, and the tree itself is huge. Why can't we set out its plantation? That variety of honey is used to heal a lot of diseases. Tuberculosis is treated with honey, for instance. You see, you said a very good, why can't we use the trees in the industrial scale? Why can't we grow actinidia in the industrial scale? Why not make actinidia jam and marmalade? I already see these jars in the stores. You have just said a very valuable, the key word, plantations. The the point is that plantations help us to utilize our entire knowledge about plants to implement all the technologies and biotechnologies developed for these herbs. I should admit that in many East Asian countries, some farmers have already started growing herbs on plantations and use that raw material for making drugs and timberwood and on and on. Pavel, when that comes true, it's possible to make in the Far East. Yes, right now, all the scientists working in the region are trying to persuade the authorities that it is a very important step and it would stimulate the development of herb raw materials production, along with production based on that raw material, to create working places, to create working places, and to make scientific research. The research to develop new technology of making herbal raw materials on an industrial scale. What we are discussing now is a matter of future. The point is that only plant cultivating technologies have been changed for the past couple of centuries but the number of plants hasn't been greatly enlarged. The wild plantations where a lot of useful herbs are grown altogether are made only on trial fields. The Far Eastern nature is a real treasury. Unfortunately, we are used to a different way of dealing with it. We kill, catch, dig out, and take away what we can. However, if we get rid of that filthy habit, if we start setting out plantations and growing herbs, plants and animals and develop new varieties there, then we will use such plantations for ages. And, which is vitally important, without causing any damage to the environment. However, it's a matter of future. Hopefully, of the nearest future. Well, I guess we've been lucky so far. We have had a good time here enjoying the warmest time of the early Far Eastern fall, have seen the most poisonous snake, and, which is the most important thing, have outlined the future development of that rich region. The most valuable treasures of the Primordia region have just started being developed. <laughs>